Welcome back to Exploring Distant Worlds. In this episode, we're going to take on a very, very large topic, the galactic economy, and actually the galactic and the planetary economy. All the data that's presented to us, the different types of resources, how does that all work, what does it all mean? We're going to try to demystify that, and it's something that can be really and initially very intimidating, one of the most intimidating features in the game, in my opinion. But before we jump into that, I want to look at a couple of components that we have recently unlocked through our research. And the first of which is fairly controversial and can be quite difficult to understand. It gets a little complicated. So we're talking about the energy collector. And if we watch our spaceport here, take a look at the fuel gauge as we advance time. And we can see that it got filled back up there, but we're pretty steadily going through our fuel. And of course, that's being used up by the reactors in order to power the components on the station with the energy that they require. If we take a look here now at a mining station, Elast Mining Station, we're going to see the same effect really, but it's happening much, much more slowly. You have to let a fair amount of time pass before you can actually see the fuel gauge drop. There, we just went down one. Now, there are some rules here as far as how the energy collectors work, and their basic function is, well, let's not use all that fuel in the reactors. Let's just collect the energy from your local star and power our components that way. First of all, whatever you're going to power has to be stationary, which means that, you know, ships moving back and forth, they can't utilize their energy collectors. So obviously bases are a good target for them. Also, you know, military ships that maybe they're just going to hang out somewhere and wait for an order to go attack. They're a good target. Construction ships are a really good one. Exploration ships I tend to not use it on because they will simply be moving all over the place so much. I don't want them to be stationary. So I'm not going to add it to those, but I'll use it for most of the kinds of ships. Then we have to consider how far away are we from the star because that's going to impact the amount we can collect. You cannot use energy collectors in deep space regardless of condition. They will produce nothing at the very edge of the system and increasing amounts as you get closer to the star. It's a linear effect. And then also every star has different amounts of energy that it'll produce. If we look at Kerbis here, notice the three types of energy. That's actually a legacy bit because way back in the early days of Distant Worlds development, they were going to go with three different kinds of energy collectors for the three different types of energy. But they decided, you know what, that's going to make things too complicated from a ship design standpoint. So they boiled it down to one. And so you're only concerned here about the total amount between the three categories added up, in this case, 72. How much of it is solar, microwave, and x-ray does not matter in any way. So if we compare that then, not every star is the same. For example, Cytisea over here is a white dwarf star, which gives us more energy, less solar, but far more of the other types. Totals, I think, 98 is probably the math there. And so that's significantly more energy that will be produced here. And so it becomes a real challenge for your design. If you look at one more system, Reshi, that's another main sequence like Kerbis, similar amount, but actually about 70 energy here. But it becomes a challenge to design because you need to consider, you know, all the different possibilities in terms of, you know, you might be at a high energy star, low energy star, might be closer or further away for a better energy situation. But in general, the cost benefit analysis for this is under basically optimal conditions, you're going to be paying about 40 credits per year to maintain an energy collector. The cost of the fuel, producing the fuel is going to be less than that. However, that doesn't mean that they're not worth getting. There's a lot more to it than that. For example, if you don't have to transport fuel back and forth to stations, well, then your freighters are fueled up to ship other resources around in case you happen to have a shortage of them. You will also have a situation where they don't have to burn fuel, shuttling your fuel back and forth. The other thing that I think is really good to consider is that fuel shortages suck. They are really pain in the butt. They will cause everything to grind to a halt. And so just preserving more of your fuel against that happening, that and freeing up the freighters, in my opinion, makes energy collectors more than worth it. Let's get these energy collectors on some designs, starting off with our spaceport. And the way it's presented can be pretty misleading, I think. So it's got the potential energy 24. And if we start adding these, that gets added to this energy collection field up here. It can really lead you 
quickly to conclude, this is what I did when I was first looking at it. Okay, just need to make that higher than the static energy usage and we'll have enough. But as we've seen, it, you know, that doesn't take into account those scaling effects. They don't know where you're going to build this design. So this is actually a good rule of thumb. Having energy collection equal to static energy usage is going to be enough for at least 90%, probably more, of the cases where you're going to be building stations so if you have it for example near the very very edge of a star that's fairly low energy then no it wouldn't be enough but almost anywhere else it would be and most of the locations you would build then you'd have extra energy collector capacity that would effectively be wasted so if you want to make sure you're almost never shipping fuel to your stations then this would be the way to go if you have more tolerance for oil, I'll ship to a few of them, but let's not have as much overkill on the energy collector for stations that are closer to a high energy star. You can go that direction. Personally, I like to go about 60%, two thirds on this in most cases. I did test out how it's gonna work for this spaceport. And it turns out that two energy collectors is almost enough because we're about, I don't know, maybe a third, a quarter distance from the star to the edge of the system. But three will definitely be enough. And so that's what I'm going to go with here. But just as a general rule for bases that you'll be building in various locations, you can play around with that. Now, in terms of the next component, because we also got a basic proximity array. And these are basically for tracking incoming, outgoing traffic, you know, hostile ships, etc. And the range here, 48,000. Now, the size of your system is in the vicinity of about 25,000. So this is about twice that range that we can see. And you can tell that most of the traffic we're not going to catch with this. But this is just an entry level. You could just say, look, it's not really worth putting this on yet. Let's wait till the tech gets better. I'm going to put one of these on each of my stations so that maybe each one isn't going to do much. But if I were to have several of them working, I have a better chance. And then we can gradually upgrade them as we move forward. So we'll throw that in place. And then we're also, of course, going to want to upgrade our resorts and you can see these static energy usage low enough that one energy collector should be plenty and of course then the proximity array ups that to 22 usage still more than enough research station we will do the same thing and no problems there and then I also want to of course get one set on our engineer, which again has quite low static energy usage. I won't bother building the proximity array on them. So you can see that a single energy collector for our early designs is going to be more than enough. Jumping then into our economic deep dive, let's take a look first of all at what's going on here currently on Reese. So on our details here, we have the type of planet, we have the size and the quality. If you're on the native type planet, which of course we are, this is our native location, then you get a 10% bonus to your maximum population. We've seen how important that is. Construction speed, research speed, income, all based to some degree on your population. Then we have the size and the quality, which your maximum population is also proportional to the square of those. So the formula actually goes your size divided by 10,000, square that, quality divided by 100, square that, multiply those two together, multiply by two and a half, and then we add our native 10% bonus on top, and all that math is done gives us 17 to 18 billion people at the maximum we can reach. So obviously, still quite a ways to go. Then moving on down to value, this is basically a raw economic number. The only thing it includes is your population, and multiply that by your development, and you're going to get your value. The gross domestic product is population and development and whether or not you have any corruption which is something we'll get into later once we expand to be a larger empire we don't have to deal with any corruption at the moment leader bonuses there's a scale factor based on the difficulty level but quality also plays in here as well quality is an absolutely hugely important factor if you have a quality of 50 percent then your planet then that's basically neutral for your planet's revenue if you have under 50 percent quality planet, it's going to actually lose you money. If it's above 50%, you can gain money from the planet, but not very much if it's low. General rule of thumb, if a planet is below 60%, unless you really need it for strategic reasons, you don't want to capture it, colonize it for economic reasons, because it's just not going to be worth 
the effort, but definitely not below 50% for economic reasons. Then once you find your GDP through all of that, you're going to add in tax here. That's basically, you know, multiplying the tax level by the GDP and you get your income, the compliance level factoring in as well. So what about this development number though? That's a little bit more not clear yet. Well, there's two main ways you add to it and then there's bonuses. The two main ways are population. You have at least 500 million population that gives you 50% development. So when you're first starting out on a colony, it's not gonna be as much of a cash cow. Then you have 10 luxury resources. We'll get to what those are, but if you have access to at least 10 luxury resources, each one of them can give you up to additional 5%. It takes a little bit of time for them to build up to that 5%, but regular access to them will get them to those 5% each of those 10 resources, and that's your next 50%. So we're at 105. You can get bonuses from you know, racial elements. You can get bonuses if you have a planet that has ruins on it. Often there'll be a development bonus there. And so any planet there, any colony there would get a development bonus as well. If we take a look at our colony screen, we can see where that extra 5% we have is coming from, and it's from lead. We have a racial trait that gives us 5% development bonus wherever we have lead available. So all of that is going to work great for us. And now we need to really dive into the resources part, the galactic element, and that's going to happen here in the expansion planner. So there are essentially two basic types of resources, really three, strategic and luxury. So strategic are, well, you build things with it, okay? Luxuries are you don't build things with it, they contribute to your planet's development, as we have seen. And then there's what's known as super luxury resources. And if we sort by price here, those are the three down here at 100. Zentabia fluid, laurel's fruit, and uh, Caribbean spice. They're very rare, but having any of these will confer a 30% development bonus to any planet that you are able to supply with them. So we're really talking about a big boost to your economy if you're able to get any of these, and that's always gonna be a big priority if you run into them. Now, the prices will vary on the others, but strategics will tend to be at about 0.8, and that's when there's a good supply of them in your empire and in the galaxy. So if we were to, example, take a look down here, we can see actually that there is one, Ocelia, that is currently not doing great. You can see there's unfulfilled demand here and we don't have very much of it available. So we have an increased price for Ocelia. And that means that everything that we have that requires Ocelia for maintenance is going to cost more for maintenance than it would otherwise. So you wanna keep these at 0.8 and clearly we're going to want to target Ocelia wherever we can find it in order to get that done. And then of course the luxury resources they operate on a similar principle, but they tend to be more expensive. And you can see some of them are higher and we're all the way down here. So that will also affect, you know, trading prices. If we want to do a smuggling mission to supply us with a certain resource, if it's more expensive, then we're going to pay more for it. Now down here at the bottom, we can sort out various things. They are listing potential colonies here and we can, you know, dispatch colony ships to them once we get to that. We haven't developed that technology yet, but you can do that automatically here. If you sort this differently, like, for example, we can show, okay, these are all the resources that we have currently developing in our empire. And then we could perhaps look at resource targets by our empire priority. That Things that they think you need that are out there have been discovered. I find this one isn't that useful. I do like to use targets by galaxy priority, and I do also like to have show asteroids on typically. But now we can see, okay, a much broader stretch of things. And you unfortunately can't tell it exactly which different resources to show. Like it might not show ones that you want when you have this on all resources. So that's kind of annoying to me. But I can also just say, look, just show me this. Okay, well, I don't know where any Krabian Sprice is. Or show me Megalos Nut. Nope. Not that either. Lead. Okay. Now all of a sudden we've got a bunch of different options. It's going to show me everything that I know of that has lead. And then you can, you know, build mining stations there just from this screen. And as you go out and expand more, this is going to be really crucial because you're not going to want to just go around hunting and looking at each individual rock or asteroid or planet or moon or whatever. Just come here and find, you know, you can 
you've got the distance and any races that are known there and you know, quality and the size of it and all these different elements that you can use to filter and say, okay, this is where I want to build my next mining base. Now we're about to finish our research facility here. So I want to take a practical look at how this is going to work. If we jump into our research, we can remember that we've got 14% and 6% here from Asari, no location bonus. And if we move ahead, let's get this thing done. Okay, research station has been constructed. We can achieve technology breakthroughs faster. Uh, galvanizes the resolve of population, getting short-term boost to our economy. And we definitely should station suitable research scientists there. Let's get that done. So we want to move Asari out there because you have the energy bonus and there's now something for you to do in a location with that. And Nasuri, you will be assigned to the spaceport. And now we have to wait a bit for the transfer to go through around the end of the month. And we actually have to wait a little longer than that because it takes some time for the new bonuses to actually cycle through. It seems to be about a month. But we're not in any hurry. We have our exploration ship out various places. We've got a couple of them going different directions. You know, you're headed over this way. The one is still working on Kerbis system itself. And we really don't have any other bases we want to build. The resort bases are underway. So we're not in a huge rush. Let's see how we're looking now. Okay, we're not there yet. Let's get everybody else set in place and retrofitted. Okay, you can just hang out for the time being. And another one. And there we go. So now we've got the 16% weapons from Reese Spaceport, but 22% energy here. And we can see our increased numbers now. This is fast enough to get that expensive GearX Hyperdrive research done in about four years once it's started. So we are at the maximum research potential that we can possibly do at the moment. And moving forward, we're going to want to accelerate time a little bit faster. We're trying to get our exploration ships out and as much scouted. We'll see if they come up to any Ocelia or any other key resources that we want to get. But this is mostly not going to be about expanding our mining. It's about getting our research through to the next advances, particularly in the warp drive, and also getting exploration done so we know where we're headed once we have those faster capabilities. Well, thanks for watching, everybody. There is much more to be discovered in the early warp era. See you next time.